Snap Judgment Studios. You're about to hear stories from the Luminary Original Podcast Spooked. To get more as they release, subscribe to the Luminary channel on Apple Podcasts or directly on Luminary. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Now, several years ago, when my boy was born, there was a problem. And I've told you parts of the story before. A tiny family sucked into the bowels of the medical industrial complex. The neonatal intensive care unit. The NICU. A place I pray no parent ever has occasion to enter. A land of monitors and tubes and instruments of all sorts protruding from our tiny baby boy. Worry, fear, we sit near his bedside, wedged into these almost medieval seating contraptions and quickly notice that mistakes, the wrong medicine, an incorrect formulation, a medical miscommunication, mistakes are often made right as one shift of nurses and doctors pass off their duties to the next shift. And a watchful parental eye can be the difference between hope and tragedy. We can't afford any mistakes and vow to be there 24-7 monitoring the monitors. Often sit next to him at night in the hospital gloom, the only light, the fluorescent reflection from the hallway or the blinks and flashes of various machines look down at my son struggling fighting so hard, so early, eyes squeezed shut, fist holding tight to my finger, waiting for the shift change to make sure that in that space there is no information lost, no monitors left unchecked, no accidental mishaps, because it is in the in-between space that things Things often go awry. Today on Snap Judgment, our unholy tradition, we proudly present stories trapped beyond the veil from our sister show, Spooked, a luminary original. And I hope you're not looking for a place to spend the night. We proudly present our All Hallowed Eve Spook Special, The In-Between Space. My name is from Washington. Hold someone close if you dare walk this dark path while you're listening to Snap Judgment. Spook starts. Again with Kimberly. Kimberly's husband, he's a big wig at a car dealership. Every now and then, the company sends him on a nice little trip to a conference in Florida. Kimberly loves it. Her husband, Colin, smoozes with his colleagues, and she gets to pamper herself. At least, that's how it usually goes. Spook. Bra 
sprawling resort. And where we were brought was this rather grand suite with two master bedrooms, a full kitchen, a beautiful living area, a big deck that looked over the golf courses. My husband was going to be busy at the reception, so I anticipated being able to sit there, drink a glass of wine, read a novel, and relax from the trip. I said, you go do your reception with your friends, and I'm going to get myself a nice bath here. I'll see you later. I had a particularly difficult job at the time, and I was feeling stressed. This bath was going to be my chance to put away the cares and the worries that I had been carrying over the last few months. It was after he had left and I was drawing the bath and getting things ready, taking out my book, unpacking, that I started to feel really uncomfortable in the room. And that's unusual. I'm very comfortable, typically, being by myself. We live in rural Vermont. So I didn't quite understand why I was feeling, I guess, anxious might be the word. But I shook it off. I turned on the television in the living room, CNN, where you have the talking head going today on Tuesday in the news, that kind of thing. I thought it would just make me feel a little less unsettled. I got into the bathtub. I started to put all the little salts in there and enjoy the bubbles. While I'm sitting in the bathtub, I'm thinking about how I should be enjoying myself and how I am absolutely not enjoying myself. At some point, the television was getting louder, slowly. Like somebody was using a remote control and they turn it up twice and it's a little bit louder. It's still not loud enough, so they turn it up a little bit more and they turn it up a little bit more. I'm thinking, well, Colin must have come back into the room. That's what my head is telling me, but my body and my heart are not telling me that it's him because I know what he sounds like. I know his walk. I got out of the tub, put a towel around me, looked around the corner, didn't see anybody, cautiously went over into the living area where the television was, and it was quite loud at this point. I'm thinking, I'm in here with something that I can't see. So you have to understand our house is very old and it is also very close to a cemetery. We've heard footsteps in the house that didn't make sense before. A door being closed after I know that it's open or vice versa, but I never felt threatened or afraid. I was like, okay, I'm out of here. I threw on my clothes very quickly and left to go find Colin. I went downstairs to the reception area where everything felt completely normal, just one of those conference gatherings. And then we had dinner and all those things that they do at some place like that where they say, oh, this is wonderful, you sold such and such, or we bought such and such, and, you know, very boring. I didn't say anything even to Colin. I wanted him to be able to concentrate on making those connections, networking, being pleasant with the company that was hosting us. I thought, ah, it's just in my head. Maybe there's something from the flight. I I don't know. So I dismissed it and, and tried to just forget about it. That first night when we got back from the reception, I can't say I was in love with the place, but I wasn't frightened the same way I was when I was alone earlier. The next day, I had the day to myself. I went in to go make something to eat in the kitchen. While I was in the kitchen, as I had my back to the counter, I have this experience of being watched and being watched in a way that 
somebody really hates you, like they're so angry you know something bad's going to happen, it was so intense that I actually said, I don't know who you are, I don't know what you are, but I'm leaving now. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I was actually afraid in that moment that I wouldn't be able to open the door to get out of the room. After that, I wouldn't be in the room by myself. I spent that day walking the property, getting lunch in their restaurant, reading outside. I thought that there must be something very wrong inside of me because there was nothing that had actually happened. I didn't see anything. This was all inside me. I must have just been out of my mind. The night before we left, I was tired. I was just very much looking forward to getting up in the morning and leaving. There was some game that Colin wanted to to watch. So I went into the bedroom and he went into the other bedroom. It took me a while to go to sleep because I didn't feel safe. Middle of the night, I woke up. I felt a sense of absolute dread because I could hear somebody breathing through their nose. And I heard slight rustling as if somebody's in a dress. I knew that there was somebody next to me on the side of the bed. I was on my side where the alarm clock was. It was 2.13. I remember staring at that 2.13 for a good long time. I'm thinking about, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do this. And if it's going to attack me, it's going to attack me to my face. I really don't know how I got the courage, but I rolled over. What I saw was a short, older woman, a little heavy set, with dark hair, with this really hateful grin on her face and these piercing eyes. Not what I expected. But I didn't have much time to think about it because we locked eyes and then boom, she jumped on top of me so fast much faster than you could ever possibly expect some old, heavyset woman to be able to move. And the weight was so much heavier than it should have been. She looked maybe five feet two. What it felt like when she was on me could have been a football player. And I remember her hands being quite small, but incredibly strong around my throat, choking me and and so gleeful in her hate and how much she wanted to cause pain and, and hurt. I tried to fight back. I tried to push, but the weight that was on me and the strength of those tiny hands just had me paralyzed. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna die. This thing is gonna kill me. While this woman was on top of me, and I can't breathe, I felt another presence. It came in on the same side of the bed. I did not see any form in that second presence, but I knew that they were there. I didn't hear words, but I sensed comforting. It's going to be okay. That second presence was equally strong, equally angry, but not at all angry with me. It was angry at that which was on me. And the force of that other being shoved to get whatever was on me off of me. It was a huge shove, like if a Mack truck pushed something off of you and it worked. The woman that was on top of me was gone. I laid there for a minute, trying to 
process this. One of the thoughts that came through my head is, I've got to have bruises. I have to have hand marks on my neck. I got up and went into the bathroom and turned on the light. There was nothing on my neck. I thought, I have to be losing my mind. This doesn't make any sense at all. I really can't tell you why I didn't go get Colin. I went in shock back to bed and watched YouTube videos, puppy YouTube videos for the rest of the evening. I did not go to sleep after that. Who could? It was too traumatizing. Morning came, packed up all my stuff. Colin was packing up his stuff too. We had an early flight to catch. So it was still dark when we were getting ready to leave. Colin called down to the person who was driving us back to the airport, saying that we were ready to to go. Colin went to lock the door, and he says, Thank God I'm going to leave this creepy room and that creepy old lady behind. My, My jaw just dropped. I said, what did you just say? What do you mean? It was the last night that we were there. I I woke up at 1, 2 o'clock. Directly across the room in the corner, staring straight at me, was an old woman. She was a creepy, little malevolent, plump old lady. It's more nonchalant than anything. Kind of like, hey, I'm here, and you should be scared, maybe. It wasn't long. It was five minutes. I had tingles on my skin and this prickly feeling, and finally she left. When you see something like that, you kind of are like, ooh, what else we got going on here? I'm like, there's something in this room. I get up. I look in the closet. I go in this little sitting room. I look everywhere. I open up the door to the toilet room. Then I open up the door to the shower room, look inside the shower. And then I looked around the common area and there was nothing there. I didn't know what I was looking for. I assumed something had to be there or something more would happen, but it didn't. So I kind of laid there, maybe fell back in and out of consciousness sleep for another hour or so. We had to get up very early. I think we left the room at like 5.30. And as he's shutting the door and locking it, he says, goodbye, nasty old woman in your creepy room. I was like, are you serious? And so I told him what my experiences were. I'm just starting to tingle. Skin crawling, hair standing up, spooked. It is that chill that comes over you where everything just seems not so real I was just like wow so this really did happen I was nervous enough that when I left and was walking out of the hotel I'm like oh hopefully she doesn't follow us on the shuttle and hopefully she doesn't get on the plane with us we definitely when we do travel now we scope out the room if it doesn't feel good to me, then we'll request another, which may make me not the most popular among hotel staff, but after this experience, I don't take any chances. I'm not putting myself through that again. Thank you to Spook listeners Kimberly and Colin for sharing their story. Original score for this piece was by Doug Stewart. It was produced by Ann Ford. Now, if you want more Spooked, if you need more Spooked, be afraid. Spook Season 7 has risen. Available on Luminary Channel on Apple Podcasts or directly on Luminary. 
at luminary.link slash spooked. And no, know that this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could wake up one day in the dark only to realize this isn't your bed and this isn't just dark. And are you wearing a suit? What is this box? It feels like the inside of a coffin? And even then, then you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PRX. If you enjoyed that, get more episodes. Subscribe to the Luminary channel on Apple Podcasts or directly on Luminary.